Hello and welcome to the uh, CNI Deep Dive. Um, we've got a, a couple of the CNI project maintainers here. Um, before we get started, I uh, just want to put up some information. This is this is the slide that usually appears at the end. And I will put it up again at the end. But uh, if you um, are totally new to CNI, I'd really recommend you start with the intro session, uh, which which if you're watching this live streamed yesterday. But uh, there's a link there. Um, if you want to look at the software, the spec, anything like that, it's in the those GitHub repos, uh, and we do have our own Slack. Um, Although I, I hope uh, if you're live, I hope you're on the uh, KubeCon chat and uh, we do have, uh, we, we're here, Bruce and I should be live at that time. So please get asking your questions if you have some. This talk, we're gonna go through a uh, very brief, what is CNI, um, just kind of set the scene. Uh, Bruce is gonna talk it's a deep dive, so he's going to go really deep into the technical details of CNI extensibility. And then I'm going to talk about some security issues that, that shed a, a different light on the project. Um, then we should have time for questions at the end. Um, so let's get going. Bruce. Yes. Hi, everyone. This is Bruce. I'm a, software, I'm a software engineer at Ant Financial uh, from China. Uh, my major work is, you know, on some container networking, including the, you know, building some network plugins for our Kubernetes clusters, the ingress controller and the load balance operator, or something like this. Uh, for the CNI team, I'm a freshman. I joined the team uh, since September last year. Uh, my GitHub ID is Mars1024. So if you have any question, just ping me online. Hey, Brian. Thanks, Bruce. Um, so my name is Brian Borum. I work for Weaveworks, uh, which is, is probably best known as the GitOps company right now. But we were very early into the container networking scene with WeaveNet. Uh, I've been lead maintainer on WeaveNet for about five years now. I'm also a maintainer on the CNI project and a couple of other CNCF open source projects uh, yeah, like Cortex, for instance. I'm on GitHub Tube, although uh, it's probably more entertaining to find me on Twitter. Uh, Bborum is my handle most places. OK, um, let's open up. Uh, I'm just going to give you the, the um, very uh, high level view of uh, what is CNI. Um, so the basic idea uh, is that uh, that you, or, or probably a container runtime run by you, uh, has some containers uh, and you want to attach them to uh, the network, which is at the, the bottom of the screen. Um, so the uh, CNI is the kind of the glue in the middle. Um, a lot of the, the hard work about setting up the containers is run, is done by what we refer to as a container runtime. So that's very commonly Kubernetes, but CNI is used with Mesos, with Cloud Foundry, with Rocket, with Podman. Uh, so CNI is agnostic to all of those different runtimes and it's equally uh, wants to be even handed about which network you're using. So CNI defines a specification. That's the most important part, how you t talk and make a request. Um, and then it, it, we also have some library code to help you implement that and some, some, um, base plugins that, that, uh, are used by many people. But, uh, it's important to say that, that a lot of the, um, uh, CNI kind of sits in the middle, and, and a lot of the questions people have are really about the upper layer, about who's calling CNI, and a lot of the questions are about the lower layer, um, uh, who's implementing CNI. But um, that's that's where it sits. That kind of sets out the uh, overall position. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Bruce now, and uh, Bruce is going to tell us about uh, the whole subject of CNI extensibility. 
Yes. First, let's take an overview to the CNI accessibility. Uh, as we know, the CNI has defined the uh, specification between the container runtime and the plugins, but uh, this is not enough because sometimes we want to pass some you know, dynamic or custom information to our plugins. Uh, for some case, for example, if we want to assign some IP address for a container, if we want to set uh, bandwidth, host port mapping, Mac or MTU for our container interfaces, this is this is this cannot be done by spec. Uh, so to handle these user cases, we need to override the inputs to our plugins. This is called CI accessibility, you know, beyond spec. And uh, we have been thinking this question from the beginning of CNI, and uh, actually the CNI have uh, evolution way from the CNI arguments to arguments in config to capabilities. Uh, in my opinion, I think this way is, uh, you know, from easy to wise, from free to customized. So let's come to the first answer of, let's come to the first answer of CNI accessibility, the CNI arguments. Uh, the CNI arguments is born with the original CNI spec. You know, it appeared a long time ago. And uh, just as its name, it was passed by the environment variables, you know, when we're calling the plugin. And uh, its format is, some key value pairs separated by semicolons in a single string. And, uh, you know, uh, CNI arguments is, you know, it's an easy way. It's easy to be implemented and uh, easy to be used to be, deb to be debugged. And uh, because we can carry, we can carry several uh, key value pairs in a string, uh, in one time, it's flexible. Uh, but uh, CNI arguments has a worst limitation. It because the string is flat, it cannot. It's not easy for for it to hold uh, structured data, so, such like JSON. So CNI arguments has been deprecated and uh, takes the lowest priority. So here's the question. If we uh, do not use events to pass our arguments, what should we use instead? So with this question, we come to the second answer of CNI accessibility, the arguments in config.json. You know, please take a look at the right picture. We can see the arguments is a special field in the network config JSON. So this is because we think the JSON network config is a better place to hold all the dynamic information. And uh, this way it's easy to hold the structured data because it's just in a structured data JSON. And uh, the history, the argument in config JSON is introduced in spec 0.2.0 and uh, is implemented in code release 0.4.0. But uh, this way still have some limitations. The first limitation is uh, usually we get the network configuration from disk. It's a fixed uh, value. But uh, if we want to fill the dynamic information into it, we have to read it, parse it, and uh, fill it, you know, override it. So the override function has to be implemented by ourselves, you know, by the user. The second limitation is, you know, just at the uh, format, you know, we carried all the in dynamic information in a single map. So this map will be passed to every plugin, whatever the info is needed or not. So uh, I don't think this is a good way. Uh, the CNI accessibility is designed for carrying extra information, you know, 
the, the ability beyond the spec, but should it be fully customized? I don't think so, because this will cause some control loss. We want to pass specific arguments to specific plugins. You know, this is what we want. And uh, with these questions, we come to the latest answer. The capabilities, yes, which has another name, the runtime configuration. And the uh, capabilities take uh, two main advantages over the previous ones, two ones. And uh, the first advantage is, you know, plugin can define this additional fields in network config. You know, this can be used as pre-validation. And uh, secondly, uh, the, um, we can use this additional field to, to, you know, to filter the information, pass specific uh, information to specific uh, plugins. This will help to remove redundant information. And uh, the second advantage is, advantage is the LibCMI has implement uh, override function for us. Uh, we, we don't have to implement the uh, config override function ourselves. And uh, the picture below showed how the capability works. You know, here is a, a plugin named Pod Mapper, and uh, it declared in the configuration that it need a capability named Pod Mappings. Then the uh, libcmi will uh, gather the dynamic information from upstreams and uh, into a map. Then the libcmi will search the map with uh, with the key port mappings. If found, it will generate a new JSON, which is filled by the, the value. Yes. You can see the runtime config field is a new field filled by uh, filled by the libcmi. Then the the libcmi will pass the new JSON to the plugin, you know, with uh, extra information. So, as we know, the CNI extensibility has you know a long journey to the capabilities, but is capability the final answer for the dynamic configuration? Uh, for now, in my opinion, I don't think so, because capabilities still have some limitations. The first limitation is uh, if you want to introduce a new capability, it needs some cost. First, we need to change the com network config Secondly, we need to do some code change in container runtime. This is, you know, the cost. Uh, the second limitation is now the capabilities is only come from container runtime, which means that the actual information can only be passed from upstream to plugins. But in some case, uh, we think that uh, you know, the extra information can be generated by the previous plugin, uh, which is expected to be passed to the next plugin. In this case, capability won't help us. So I, th I think capability still needs some improvements in the future. First, uh, I think capability need uh, self-discovery. And uh, secondly, the I think capability should be passed over plugins, you know, not just from the upstream. Uh, at, at last, I think, um, you know, for the CNI team, we should provide more utility package about the CNI extensibility. So if someone want to introduce some, you know, extra information to their plugins, uh, we want to make it easier. Uh, in the end of my part, I will share you a, a comparison summary. You know, the, the three kind of CI accessibilities, uh, you know, from different uh, perspective, uh, I think the 
capability is the most recommended way for the CNI extensibility. So if you want to extend the CNI, use capabilities. So next part, Brian will give you the something about the recent CVEs. Hi, Brian. Thanks, Bruce. Um, that was really interesting. And uh, just thinking while while you were talking, uh, you know, if, if anyone listening to this is is interested in in that idea of extensibility, um, please do. Uh, message in the in the chat here or uh, come over to our slack on the the cncf slack um the cni project is is pretty small and basically volunteer run so uh if you do want to engage with us you have ideas for enhancements or or whatever um if if you're willing to do some work uh, please please come on and engage with us if you just want to request a, that we do work uh might take a bit longer um Okay, so I'm prepared some slides to talk about CVs. What do we what do we mean by CV? We mean some kind of security vulnerability, and they're they're given uh, numbers, they're given unique identifiers, so that <clears throat> when we talk to someone, uh, we know we're talking about precisely the same issue uh, if we have that identifier. So I, I picked a couple. Um, uh, first one I'm going to talk about has the uh, glorious name of CVE 2020-10749. It, the name doesn't mean anything, like I say, it's just a, just a tag, just a unique identifier. But it is about this router advisory message. Um, and then I'm going to talk about a uh, totally different issue after that. Um, let's look at the, the first one. Um, what is the scene? I've got uh, I've got one host here. Um, the blue box represents your ordinary code that you're running, some containers uh, in your system, um, and the red box uh, somehow an attacker is running code there. Now you might think, you know, my my system is protected. Attackers can't get in and run code, um, but maybe they maybe they attack the upstream supply chain you know maybe maybe they uh, coerced one of your developers to put the code in or maybe uh, some library that you're using some tool that goes into a container really difficult to to ensure that the the whole supply chain is is pure and perfect so um so maybe the attacker can get some malicious code sneak it in in the the guise of something that you want to be running anyway uh if that has happened and um the attacker sends this message, forges a fake router advisory message. Uh, and, and what they say in this attack is, is they, they basically tell Linux to send all the IPv6 traffic here. Um, many, many systems are running with the capability of IPv4 and IPv6, but really only IPv4 configured. Uh, they're really only expecting to use v4. So if the attacker sends this fake message saying, Hey, send me all your IPv6 traffic. Well, Linux will obey that instruction. So the next part of the attack is when your innocent software tries to open a, a connection. You know, maybe this is making a request, maybe uh, maybe an HTTP request, something like that. Um, there's this cool thing that called happy eyeballs. It's, it's kind of a weird name. You can look it up. I'm, didn't invent it. Um, and the basic idea of happy eyeballs is, is that when you open a connection, it's going to open uh, or attempt to open an a IPv4 and an IPv6 connection simultaneously. Um, and it's going to pick the fastest one to, to come back. And the, the reason for this, the reason this exists, this happy eyeballs algorithm, uh, is is we're kind of in a transition from IPv4 to IPv6, and we we want to be even-handed. We want to uh, you know not not favor one or the other. So literally, those requests are are sent out simultaneously as as far as possible. Um. So, uh, in if you have this uh, malicious code, unfortunately, running in your system, 
then the um, the v6 request is going to hit the the attacker uh, because they're running right next to your real code uh, their response is very likely to be the fastest one so what we end up with is that your client is now talking to the attacker and running a fake service they do have to um, run the entire TCP stack uh, inside their code the Linux won't kind of legitimately root packets um, to to uh, a, a fake attacker in, in this way um, but it, it's it is perfectly feasible to to implement a TCP stack in in user code so um, so this attack can work um, they can uh, make fake responses they can mount a man in the middle attack you know take your take your real request and maybe change it slightly and pass it on send the money to their bank account instead of your bank account um, this uh, this this vulnerability was um, reported to us and we had to take action so what uh, what did we do I've drawn a few uh, different mitigations on on this slide uh, first one over on the far right is is the code change that we made um, this was to change a setting in to Linux saying do not accept router advisory messages except RA equals zero uh, like like many of these things the actual code change is like two lines just set that setting it did have to be deployed in every different implementation of CNI so so the base plugins had to do it the uh, I had to do it in weave net uh, you know maybe calico had to do it all the different implementations had to make that change to disable it um, and there's no legitimate reason why why Linux would be accepting router advisories from a from an ordinary container so that's one mitigation that we put up um, the next one coming left uh, I I would definitely recommend that you turn off what's called cap net raw this is a capability um, which is like a Linux permission to send raw packets this is what allows an attacker to forge anything they like uh, router advisory messages the entire fake message the, the entire TCP stack none of that is possible if you just don't allow people to to forge packets um, if you insist that they go through the operating system to open sockets and make requests so um, so I'd very much recommend that it is it is on by default and uh, uh, so you have to turn it off um, but I, it's for me that's a recommendation and the, the last one I'll mention if you had some kind of authentication on your connection I, I've put TLS here it could be something else um, if if that is the case then the attacker has to work harder because not only do they have to get the fake code and send the fake messages but they have to um, have your credentials to participate in a in an authenticated connection whether it's TLS or something else so um, uh, so definitely think about those kind of mitigations not only for this vulnerability but for future vulnerabilities that we've not discovered yet um, having described that one let's let's look at another one um, this one's about demons listening on on 127.0.0.1 this is this is the local host address or the loopback address um, so in this picture we've got two hosts um, one of them is is listening on this address and and most people I, I would certainly have told you this before I knew about this vulnerability most people will believe that that address can only be accessed from the local host uh so they think it's safe i just listen on that local host address um and nobody can come in from another machine um if somebody does try to do that well they can an attacker on another machine can say uh you know please will you route packets to that address if they have control of of this machine machine b in my picture um then those packets will go out and if they're reasonably close if they're on a local network to the host they're trying to attack I, I just made up an address here 36 whatever um, if that's close the packets will arrive uh, but Linux will, will drop them 
um, they're, they're called Martians, uh, Martian packets. They appear from outer space. So um, uh, that's the normal, the expected state of affairs. Uh, most people will tell you that's what happens. You cannot route to that address. Surprise! Um, there is, uh, in, in the CNI software, there's a thing called the port map plugin. Um, and the same thing happens in, in other bits of software. Cube proxy is an example. It changes the setting. It says, I do want to route the, that local address. Um, and it, it does it for kind of intricate reasons to do with, with how traffic is redirected inside, uh, uh, for, for the mapping of services. But anyway, the, Bottom line is, if you have that setting, if you have root, root local net equals one, um, that connection is possible. Attackers can now talk to those demons that believed they could only be accessed by somebody already on the host. So what to do about this? Um, well, the code change that we, we shipped in uh, uh, proxy, for instance, and in WeaveNet, again, put out a release with this change in it, was, was to add a rule, a, a, a IP tables rule blocking those connections. Um, so that makes that safe again. Um, but once again, I, if those connections were authenticated, you know, TLS is an example, could be something else, uh, then it makes it that much harder for the attacker. So there you go, quick walkthrough of uh, two different very different vulnerabilities, but I hope it gives an insight into just how these things interrelate, how, how a bunch of different layers can kind of stack up and, and come up with a behavior that's unexpected. Um, and of course, that's what attackers do. They, they do the unexpected because, uh, because they're trying to hack your system. So um, that's the end of the uh, prepared slides. Uh, I'll put that information slide up once again. Um, if you uh, are in too deep, uh, the intro session uh, link is up there. The video should be up shortly after the original streaming. Um, our software is in two repos, one for the spec and libraries, one for the plugins, the base plugins that we support. Um, we do have our own Slack. Uh, lovely to see you there if you want to head over. Um, do note, uh, Kubernetes has its own Slack. So, so do note that difference. Um, CNI is not part of Kubernetes. It's, it's, uh, works across many different container runtimes. So, so if your question is really Kubernetes specific, please head over to their, uh, uh, their Slack instead. Okay, we're done with the prepared section. I hope you all have questions and uh, are have been typing them already, but if not, please start now and Bruce and I should be online to answer them. Thank you. All right, uh, Brian here. I hope you can hear me. We had a we had a few technical issues, uh, hence I'm not on video, but I am here live. Um, so we had a few questions already. Uh, a number of them were were kind of touched on by that last thing I said that 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 CNI is an independent project of of Kubernetes, and a lot of uh, obviously Kubernetes being a very large dominant project. A lot of the questions that people have relate to uh, Kubernetes, um, but we're not uh, really in a in a position to speak for Kubernetes. Um, they they have their own SIG network, and uh, uh, yeah, you're, you're really better off asking them. Um, question just came in uh, from Hirotaka. I hope I said that right. Uh, are there any plans to add gRPC interface to CNI? Uh, and observing that, that many CNI implementations do run a server on each node. Um, so I think we touched on this in the intro session. I mean, the, the answer is broadly yes. Um, yes, we've talked about this. Um, so uh, CNI was, was created uh, originally, the very first project to use it was the, was the Rocket project, RKT. Um, 
and and Rocket had no daemon. It, everything was daemonless. It just exec program. So that sort of followed through to the architecture of CNI, where you just exec a program. And um, yeah, you're absolutely right. So if you've got a daemon running, then talking gRPC to it is kind of more standard in in today's world, more expected. Um, it's also easier to do kind of global state things. A CNI works container by container, interface by interface in its interface, in, in its API. Um, so uh, that would definitely be an advantage of, of moving to gRPC um, that you, you could have kind of system-wide questions like, is the network up at all? Um, so yeah, we definitely talked about that. You can find in the in the repos. Actually, let me see if I can uh, move back to that slide that has the links on it. Does that work? I hope that worked. Um, yeah, take a look around. Uh, you know, just search for gRPC in the issues on the the CNI repo. You'll probably find a little bit of uh, discussion about that. And um, uh, you know, we love uh, we love help. Uh, quite a small project and basically volunteer run. Um, so, uh, if you have great ideas about how to do gRPC, uh, please get in touch. Uh, you know, you could do the coding, and uh, we'd love that. Um, okay, let me try any new questions. Um, I don't see any new ones that have come in. So let me turn to a couple that I answered um, earlier on on the on the, the Q and A typing, um, which were were about like extra attributes and passing information, kind of specifically from Kubernetes. But but as a more general point, there's there's kind of a fine distinction between what's uh, interesting to you and what's useful to everyone. And uh, we try and walk that line with the CNI project. Um, we try and keep the specification really minimal, really down to the things that apply in, in many, many, many cases. Um, and, but on the flip side, we don't want to stop anyone from doing anything. You know, that's, that's kind of, uh, anathema. The, the whole point of CNI is to allow everyone to play on a level playing field. Um, all the all the container runtimes and all the networks can come together with this very simple core interface. That's the idea. So, you know, if you come across a situation where you say, "Gee, CNI is preventing me from doing this thing that I want to do," then then by all means, get in touch, raise an issue, talk to us. Uh, um, because the requests and the responses are, are JSON. Uh, fundamentally, you can add anything you like. Uh, you know, we do, we do not barf on unexpected fields. Um, so you can add, you know, uh, Bruce in his bit was talking about uh, specific ways that we've tried to um, uh, style the way that people add fields. But fundamentally, it's JSON. You can say whatever you like. You know, you can, you can put a, a megabyte in there saying, uh, you know, whatever you want to say in your JSON. Um, and the only requirement, really, is that you get at least one runtime implementing it and at least one plugin implementing that. Um, I would say if you find, uh, you know, lots of plugins implementing it or lots of runtimes, um, then that, that would be a time to come to the CNI project and say you ought to standardize this. Uh, we actually have two levels of standardization. We have, we have the, the spec, the formal spec that everyone has to conform to. Um, and then we have a document called conventions, which um, is exactly to get out of this uh, compelling everyone to do something. Um, so we can add things to the conventions document very easily, but you know you would need uh, some evidence that it is actually a convention that, that there's a you know more than you using it um, in order for us to publish it to the world. Uh, so yeah, it, you know we're we're definitely interested in playing our part, but don't uh, don't kind of confuse the CNI project, which goes across everything, with one specific project, even Kubernetes, big as it is. But we love Kubernetes. So I'm um, uh, uh, that I'm going to wrap up. I'm on Slack. Um, 
in the uh, CNCF Slack. Um, you can ask there, and uh, or you can ask in the GitHub uh, issues. I uh, hope to see you around. Thank you very much, and goodbye for now.